But I just want to start, Leon, just before anything, how did you become a chef? How did, how did you find the world of cuisine and cooking? Well, that was more like uh, kind of uh, an accident, although uh, they, they don't exist in that sense. Um, when I was 19, I was at technical college and I, it wasn't just wasn't for me. I realized that two or three years in and only because I was good at maths and science, I thought that would be my path. And then I um, decided to stop the college and go, um, I wanted to learn about actually music management. And then, you know, when I was young, there was no course for that. So I thought I'd go to um, a hotel management college uh, near close to where I used to live in Holland. And I learned about management and then I go and manage bands. And in, the, in that first year, you had to do some cooking. And I was 19 and I mean, I, to be honest, I, did, I loved food, but I didn't even know how to boil an egg. And um, in that first year, you had to do 30 hours in the kitchen. Just You didn't teach you cooking, but just to get a feel of it. And that first day in the kitchen and intuitively, I mean, of course, this is in hindsight, I knew I can, you know, I can, I can be good at this. And, you know, I remember I was just looking around. I didn't understand anything. This was a, you know, a, up, um, a fine dining restaurant in my hometown, but I, I loved it straight away and I didn't leave the kitchen for a long time. And so, yeah. Um, you said in a TED talk, um, which I'll put the link in the chat later, it's a really good one, but you say that your love for food and sharing a meal started with family. Can you just define a little bit your ethos about sharing a meal? Because it's really at the epicenter of your work. Yes. Yeah, so one of the earliest memories I have is um, um, having dinner. You know, my dad is the eldest of nine children. And so, uh, you know, when you're five or six or maybe I was even younger, I don't I can't remember. But you don't understand the concept of maybe Yeah, I must have been younger, three or whatever. You don't understand the concept of family right yet, what uncles are and aunties and all that. But um, I was also the eldest grandchild. And I remember going to my grandparents have uh, Sunday uh, lunches in their um, in their living room where you know we had to use uh, boards and and tables so everyone could sit and it always seemed to be like a feast and you know because at home you didn't used to eat four courses and I learned later that they had to scratch stretch everything to make it four courses and um, yeah that memory always stayed with me and so, you know, that sharing and where everyone was laughing, but also, you know, there were serious conversations going on at the same time and maybe someone uh, shared a tea, but, you know, you were together as a family. And um, as I grew up, subconsciously, I was always trying to recreate that. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's just such a lovely point. And I think a lot of people forget. And I, or in a way, I think the pandemic reminded us slightly um, you know, before that, everyone's kind of watching TV, eating, doing a thousand other things, checking social media, but just having the meal and having it with other people is such a beautiful, important experience and just an amazing part of the day and the week. Um, obviously, later on, you attended uh, Calais for refugee camps and your food and cooking experience changed, I guess, yeah. a lot then. How did you come to go there? And, you know, what sort of time did you spend there? And what is it like? cooking for refugees oh well that's a big question so i i after my, i went to hotel management college i you know i became a chef had a restaurant head of food wholesale company and in 2015 so when the refugee crisis was at its height you know that that summer when we saw them on the greek isles and everyone was wondering where did they come from um i met someone at um in someone's house where i was staying for a, a week or so they were away and um, he, he was a house guest for one night whilst he was in London. And, um, you know, nowadays you become Facebook friends. And, um, but that's it really. And this was in May and a few months later, he sends me a Facebook message. We never spoke since that evening when we met, but we, we really got on. And he said, Leon, we want to start um, a kitchen in the jungle, the refugee camp in Kelly. And at the time it was still very small. And um, I had some time and I thought, yeah, I want to help. I was actually looking how I could help. And I thought go, about going to Greece, but I hadn't made any steps on that. And um, so another person who was involved bought a trailer. We bought a, a marquee, a very small marquee and three burners. And we started cooking on this. I think it was the 1st of October, 2015. And all of us thought this is going to be over in a few weeks when our 
uh, governments got their act together. And yeah, as we know, that never really happened. And you know, how foolish were we to think that they would, but that's a different story. And um, you know, honestly, we thought we we're gonna cook for 200 people a day and that's it. And you know, we're gonna have a bit of fun and help people. And it just started to explode from there. Within a week we were doing, oh, I can't remember, eight, 900 meals a day that went up to 1500 breakfast, lunch. So total breakfast, lunch and dinner. And um, yeah, it just started from there. And um, how was it? I mean, I, the best story of that is uh, I, on that first day that I arrived there. So I, I actually went on, a, on the boat and someone picked me up from the harbor. It's literally half a mile. And um, I went with my friend who asked me to help him, uh, Jonathan. We went for a walk through the camp and it was like five or six o'clock. And many of the refugees, the ones who could, were cooking a little bit for themselves on, a, on, a, on an open fire. And they started to share their food with us, people who had absolutely nothing. And they said, would you like something to eat? And first you, you say no, but then they started, we started to talk and they started to ask questions. How is it in England and all those things? And um, yeah, you start to create bonds and it came from there. And then when, you know, I was, I first went for about a week and then you're kind of touched by it. The, the first memory I have was driving into the camp and thinking, wow, it was like I was in a time warp going back into the Middle Ages. The, the camp was built on a tip. And then you're there, you're helping, you know with your background you can do something. You can't let it go. And you know, that's the same with what I'm doing now. You just can't let it go. So that's something which comes deeply innate, innately within all of us. Yeah, I think what's incredible is this this idea of people having next to nothing or nothing and still so eager to share. And that's what I picked up most from what you were just saying, just just so different to our way of life in the West of having basically everything at the disposal and so unwilling to just share it. And I think that's at the heart of the problems in sustainability, unsustainability. Is there something, you could, because with climate change, you know, Lots of refugees are, you know, refugee numbers across the world are increasing and that's from a, a world, uh, loads of different conflicts and other social political issues. But with climate change, we're going to see a vast number of refugees increasing over the next decade and beyond. So is there something you wish people understood or that they really need to know about refugee camps or the nature of refugee situations? First of all, I personally, I don't like the term refugees. Um, how can anyone be a refugee? And for a refugee, for me, you know, when you use it in that sense, as someone who's not wanted or doesn't belong somewhere or shouldn't be there. And how can it, you know, we all belong on this planet and we're all human beings? For me, that's all to it. I myself, I'm an immigrant, I'm Dutch. I've been living in London for over 20 years and I came here to start a business. And I actually had this conversation yesterday morning here in my own organization with someone and he, um, I said, but you know what, and he said, he asked me, what about refugees? I said, yeah, but what about me? I came here in 2001 to start a business. And then they say, well, but that's okay. Why is it okay that I can come and do something? And someone who's born somewhere else, you know, what here in England, we call that postcode lottery. Why is that okay? And, you know, they, they're not chances. They're not economic. I'm an economic migrant. I came here to start a business to make a better life for myself and my family. Those people, they are not. They come from very terrible backgrounds. And that's one thing, you know, I talk about the power of sharing a meal. And when you share a meal with someone, when you have a deeper conversation, because food, we all have connections with food and food slows us down. And then when you start and we all have been in those situations that you have a meal with a stranger or someone you might have known for a long time. And then they start to share their story with you. And you might say, wow, I had no idea. I know you for four years, we've been working together. So we all have our stories. And when you start thinking in that way and um, connecting, then you see, you know, we're all human beings, we're all one. And what I like, you know, what I do in my work is, you know, it's just that connection, that understanding. And when you sit down with someone and listen to their story, you realize it's not what we as human beings, what the media, which is very good to put a certain perspective on things, which is built on fear. And, you know, most people in Kelly, um, especially for the English part, 
the English or the British people thought that most people in Calais were there to come to England. That's some were because they had family here, they had friends here, and but what they really wanted is just a safe and secure place to live. That's it. Many we don't even know about came to Keller and then went to Germany and Sweden and all those countries who took on a lot more refugees than, than uh, the UK did. So yeah, just look, look, see someone as a human being, not the label we put on them. Um, just because you know we don't have a lot of time, we could talk ages on this subject, uh, but I wanna also talk about um, uh, some of your other initiatives uh, because we're, you know, we're in the climate change space. Can we, can we get started on with, with compassion and then maybe dovetail to your other work? So um, I believe you've now, with this initiative, delivered probably half a million meals, I think. Well, no, it's like, yeah, well, you know, not far off. I think this week we're hitting about 610,000. And uh, on the 25th, so by the end of the month, we're half a year old. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, incredible, to be honest, yeah. It's, it's insane. It, it, it really is amazing. And what I think is amazing, it, it all just started from you having a feeling at the yeah. start. But can you talk about that? That, that nation? Yeah, that's, sort of uh, I actually was telling this story this morning to a few people here. Um, so on last year, I woke up on the 18th of March. This was before the first lockdown here in the UK. And, you know, we were all wondering what's going to happen. Many countries around us were already in lockdown. And I realized that London would get hungry very quickly. And, you know, the industry where I spent time in, not, not all my life, but a lot of time in the hospitality industry was already laying off people because, uh, the, you know, the tourism was down, people weren't eating out so much. And um, I realized all these kitchens are going to be closed soon. Uh, all these chefs are going to be at home and all these people hungry. It's going to be easy. If we connect these kitchens together and we get surplus food and donations, we can feed thousands and thousands of people every day. And so I put on Facebook, I say, this is what I'm going to do. It's going to be called, I mean, in the beginning, we were called Compassion London. And um, going to be, so, and who has a kitchen for me? And that evening, I had a, a, a message saying, Leon, can you connect with this lady? She has a kitchen. On the 20s, I went to have a look. And on the 25th, we start cooking. And I, as soon as I had a kitchen, I put other posts on, on social media saying, who, which restaurant has surplus food for us and who likes to help? And it started from there. And in the first day, I think it was seven of us in the kitchen. And all of a sudden, this, this wave of people started showing up. And all different backgrounds, all doing different things. Yeah, you've seen the video. And um, that went so quickly within... Yeah, we, we did 60,000 in the first month. And um, yeah, <laughs> it, it just happened. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Someone has been asking in the chat actually about the greatest challenge ahead in terms of scaling Compassion London. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the admin and the managerial side and, and what challenges you see continuing this project? Oh, um, so we, I, Together with a partner organization, we're going to um, open a big kitchen in the summer uh, in East London where we can do a minimum of 5,000 meals um, a day. And that's happening. We, uh, we have the funding. We are, we'll start building it soon. Um, and, you know, I'm talking to people who come and work for us that, you know, so that that's not the biggest challenge. Um, what the challenge is at the moment is because this crisis is going on for so long, the, the, the demand is still very, very high. Uh, this is actually the last, we're in our fifth kitchen now, we're near Victoria Station for those who lo know London, uh, so central. We were in a very big kitchens. The first kitchen we had, I spoke about earlier, was quite small, but you know, we could do a lot of meals there. And then we went to, for example, we were in Wembley Stadium last May before football started again, where we did 5,000 meals a day. Then we went to Alexandra Palace, which is also very large. Um, but at the moment, it's very difficult to find a kitchen because for several economic reasons. Restaurants, of course, want to open up again. Businesses want to open or they are closed and they don't want to open the door for something like what we do because, or, you know, they are in very, themselves in very difficult situations, unfortunately. So the short term is for, is a little bit of a bigger problem. I have a kitchen where, so we're going to close here at the beginning of next week. And I have a small kitchen where we go the beginning of um, April. 
and and funding is very difficult or for the not for the long term but the short term because that's two different matters although that might sound complicated so i think for the short term and i spoke to another kitchen this morning who do like 300 meals a day they're going to close as well and so for the short term i really foresee a problem of course i hope that everything goes back to what we use i don't it's not my words i don't like it but the the, the old normal um but um yeah, the need is still high and the, the real vulnerable people, they, you know, they need support for a long time. And that's different support than we can give. But like you said in your introduction, you know, giving someone a meal for, and, you know, make them feel good about themselves and a bit of hope um, and, and show them that other people care. That's the most important. Yeah, it's incredible because, especially because you're based in London and we've seen even through the pandemic very recently, the government being so unwilling, even with just things like school meals and needing an English football, I think is Marcus Rashford to yep. basically force the government to provide the correct you know, sustenance and meals for children. It's, it's incredible that there's even, um, you know, that your work is even necessary, is even sometimes bewildering. And yep. I, I think hats off to you for, for dominating yep. the place and doing it so well. Can you talk about food wastes role in the work and you know how you get it how you use it to provide these meals so yeah i like to use the word surplus food um so we have a system in in, in, in well in europe um is that um you know everything needs to be date labeled so i know it's best before they use by date and sell by date so if a, a supermarket or a shop can't use products, can't sell products anymore, um, when it, it passes, it's on a sell by date or passes that. So then they have to get rid of it and, you know, either give it to charities or to people, but they can't, they're not allowed to sell it anymore. If you buy it on the sell by date, you, there's still, depending on what the product is, there's still a few days life on it. That's how it's all sort of calculated. Uh, best before, that's mainly for ambient products. That's just a guideline. And of course, no one wants to make anyone else ill. So the, in general, the, the guidelines on best before are very, very safe. Um, and then there is um, use by, which you know, then you're definitely not allowed to use it anymore after that date. And uh, many products are still good at that. And that, but we haven't really spoken about that in generally is that when a product comes to use by, um, then, um, you know, you can smell it like this, you know, a packet of ham or eggs, just judge it yourself. We are, you know, we are human beings. We can, we can judge ourselves if the milk is sour or not. You know, why put it in the bin only because there is a, a, a certain date on it? Not saying don't be careful, but, and, you know, it's, we at home, we think, oh, I got half a liter of milk. I won't use it anymore because I, you know, it, maybe this really not good anymore, or we think it's not good anymore. But on an industrial scale, you know, in all the supermarkets, the amount of surplus food is just staggering. It's, you know, um, the Felix project, who we work um, very closely together with, um, they are scaling up to uh, do this, the, the equivalent of 100 million meals in the next few years. It's also the amount of meals that London, that they have, you know, done service on that needs. But that's just staggering. And they, they know they can get the right surplus. It's not that we get surplus just from supermarkets we get surplus from businesses and you know it's not small amounts it's it's uh, sometimes we get pallets and pallets of of chicken uh, breast or things like that offered at the moment we had a have a whole pallet of venison mince because venison meat you know which is great meat from you know mostly from scotland uh, because the restaurant were closed weren't um, sold then so they weren't killing the venison but that created a problem that there was two million venison in you know in, in parts of england in total and now um they've been culled and it's given to food charities like ourselves to be used and actually it's a delicious meat and very lean and and good for us as well it's not grown in the way like factory farm so you know the um, the amount of surplus is just staggering. And yeah, like you said earlier, and we pride ourselves on the quality of the meals. We don't use what we wouldn't eat ourselves. And that's very, very important. So we really, you know, by the way, all my volunteers, each and every one you saw on, you know, on that video, I say 150 volunteers. It's, it's probably close 
well, between four and 500 at the moment, the amount of volunteers we have, each and every one of them has done food safety training. So they know exactly what to do. Is there um, any chance that with Compassion or Compassion on the will expand, go to other countries? Is there anyone you know embodying the same principles? Um, yeah, we, we are, there has been some, you know, very early on chats, but first, the main thing for me now is to open the big kitchen in, in about three months time, then uh, let that run and most of my core team will come with me. So, you know, there's not too much change, only that we go to a very small kitchen for a little while. And then, um, yeah, hopefully we can build some other kitchens in maybe in London or in the UK as well. And who knows what happens then. One thing I still really like to do, but that won't be this year, is uh, build social eating spaces. And that has to do more with Supper Club Compassion, which I was working on before all this started. Social eating spaces where we use surplus food. And I was inspired by that, by many things. But one of the main things, there's a, a town in, in Brazil called Belo Horizonte where in the 90s, the, the mayor wanted to end. He realized that there was a lot of poverty in his time. I think it's close to 2 million people living there. And when he did a few things, which I won't mention now, but one thing he did is he built massive restaurants where uh, what I call social eating space, where everyone could eat uh, for something like $50 cents. And um, whether you, know, you were wealthy or not, and people from all different backgrounds sat together and had a great meal, there, it was supplied by local farmers who got a decent price for their vegetables, didn't have to sell to supermarkets and everything which goes with that and, you know, food being rejected. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a very big inspiration. So I would love to have some of those. And that's something I'll be working on for the future. Why do you think there is, because I feel like there equally is and there isn't, it's almost like a imbalanced dichotomy where on the one hand, it's innately human to want to share your meal with other people. And on the other hand, especially in the Western world, it's, it's more about the private self as opposed to the, the social public self. So this idea about collectively eating with other people, these social eating spaces, what, what is your take on that? Is it, why is there not more of it? Why have we lost touch with that idea of eating with other people? And, and how do you hope to rekindle that? Well, that's a big question, which is, you know, warrants a longer discussion, but I try to answer it as, as short as I can. Um, because we live in a story of separation. We are all individuals and that's, especially in the Western world, that's how we are taught. If you go back, you know, maybe a few thousand years when we were, and, and some people on this planet still do, where you live more in tribes, um, you know, that, let's say you live in a tribe with 150 people and a few men are very good hunters. They go out and hunt and when they come back, whatever they shot, let's say a few deer, they don't say, hey, these deer are mine, I'm going to keep them now. And in those days, when you're good at, at hunting, you would bring in the food and you would share it with the whole community. Of course, in our modern world, that might be very difficult to go back to that. but. Um, so, and slowly, slowly, and then the industrial revolution, the 20th century, and you know, everything went faster and faster. And we live more and more in a world where we, we, we have the illusion of separation. And that's actually what's happening now. Our systems are crashing. And um, because, you know, we started together and we started to just keep, oh, this is mine. And, you know, I, I watched a beautiful talk by an um, Abor Aboriginal elder who said, in my language, there is no mine and things. And, um, but, you know, we have totally got lost that. And I think that's where it starts. And that's also where it starts, where we start labeling people and we call people refugees. And all of a sudden, because we call them something or we, you know, and all the horrible names we have for people, which I won't mention, pushes them away. And we think they're separate from us. But as soon as we start realizing that we're all in this together, then that starts to change. I heard a, a great anthropologist once say, you know, it, it's what we name things. If we call a fly a fly, then all of us have certain ideas about a fly. But when you don't call it a fly anymore and you think this is this beautiful animal, which is tiny, which has like us, millions and millions of cells in a body to do what it does, then things look totally different.